brother. Thank you, Milt. Praise the Lord. Good morning. So my name is Josh Bennett. I'm the youth pastor here. Um, so I wanted to come this morning and tell you a little bit about our camp um, that we just got done with. Um, and then also just kind of share where, where God was taking us um, through, throughout our camp. So first of all, I just want to start with a thank you. Because, you know, there were times, I'm not going to lie, there were times uh, right before camp, I was like, I don't know if we're going to pull this off with everything going on. Um, but your guys' support, um, both through prayer, man, the, if, you, if you guys had a prayer bracelet um, with a servant leader or a student's name on it, thank you so much for praying for them. Regardless of whether you had a bracelet or not, thank you for praying. Um, because we all know that prayer works. Um, thank you for um, the financial giving as well. About a, about a year ago, um, we had our dinner theater, and some of our students served at that dinner theater, and those that served, and, and thank, thank, thank you for your donations, that they had their whole camp paid for because of your guys' giving um, through the dinner theater, which was such a blessing. Um, and, and the last thing, thank you so much for the food. Um, hospitality team, you guys, you guys provided two different meals um, for, our, for our students, and wow, it was incredible. So um, students really, I, really just like pizza, but holy cow, they were going back for seconds and thirds and didn't really want to do anything after that last meal that you guys provided. So, so thank you so much. So it, it was a, a very interesting and different camp this year. So, um, so as, you can, as you can probably gather, our, our theme was Surrender. Um, and so uh, if you drove by the church um, over the past couple of weeks, you probably saw the big white and blue tents out there. Um, so we slept in those. Um, so despite the second weekend, we had some storms and um, got rained on a little bit. But we had a really good time. It was, it, was, it, was a, it was an opportunity for us to get outside of our comfort zones a little bit. Um, we did split up the camp. So we did um, high school the first weekend um, and then junior high the second weekend. Um, and so that, that was a really big blessing. The, the weather was, um, was a big factor um, in a lot of ways, because um, I'm not going to lie, there were some times where I was a little bit nervous. Um, before the high school camp, we thought we were supposed to get like an inch and a half of rain. Turns out we got double that. Um, so after they put out the uh, tents, I looked over there, and there was about an, about an inch or two of water sitting in the tents at one spot. So, um, but we, we made it work. We just moved the, the tarps over a little bit, and the kids honestly didn't even realize it. So... Um, <laughs> And, and then the second weekend, you know, I was like, okay, we got past that crazy wet weekend. Well, the second weekend was supposed to rain on Friday and then be like super hot Friday or Saturday, Sunday. And so I'm, you know, I'm all worrying about this. And it was just such a sweet reminder that God's in control because it, it rained a few times. But, um, but at, the, at the end of the day, the Saturday and Sunday were gorgeous. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't nearly as hot as it was calling for. And the coolest thing about it, not only was the weather not really a, a bother to us at all, um, it also was used um, in some mighty ways as well. So, um, so Randy Adams um, spoke at our, at our junior high uh, camp first, or at our high school camp first, and then Dwayne spoke at our, our junior high um, camp the next weekend. And so Sunday morning, while you guys are all in here, um, safe from the weather, um, Dwayne's up there preaching. We were under the pavilion over there. And um, all of a sudden, every time Dwayne would make, a, would make one of his points, there'd be thunder and lightning in the background. And every time he said the word Jesus, there'd be, there'd be some, some sun, thunder rolling so it was really really cool and um, even Friday night we had to delay our bonfire for like 10 minutes as the storm um, went through but we just kind of sat there and watched as the storm um, was was or as the lightning was was going off in the background and it was it was a pretty sweet time to to praise the Lord so um, we had Tucker Leadership Lab from William Jewell come out and do some team building stuff with us which was really cool um, definitely appreciative of them for that um, we had a slip and slide on the north side of the church so between that and the tents we killed a little bit of grass um, but we had a really, really good time doing that. Um, Courtney Lutz's grandma opened up her pool for us on Sunday um, for us to go uh, for both weekends for us to go have a pool party at her house. And, um, and my, my favorite part of camp, obviously, was we had some really, really cool decisions um, for the Lord, both, both um, surrendering just parts of themselves and then also surrendering their lives to Christ. We had, we had several cool um, commitments to the Lord that, that was just such a blessing. So. Thank you guys for supporting us, for praying for us, because that, that all that, um, you know, all, all, of, all of what God did, you guys were all a part of through both your prayer and, and giving and everything. So thank you so much. So um, as a reminder, you, you saw on the slides on uh, September 2nd, we're going to have a camp celebration on Wednesday night um, here on, at, in, in place of the normal Wednesday service. So come celebrate with us. Um, we'll be singing some of the camp songs that we sang there. Um, and then my favorite part is we're going to be hearing some of the testimonies from our students about what God did in their lives. So. So thank you so much. Go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. 
We are going to read the whole chapter. Our theme verse was actually Romans 6.13. Romans 6.13. So I'll, I'll kind of pause when we get there, but we're going to go ahead and read the whole chapter um, of Romans 6. So Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Verse 5, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise reckon ye yourselves to be dead un indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let us not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye, sh that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. So verse 6, 13 once again was our, was our theme verse. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of, un of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. Whether, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness, but God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, that, but ye were obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Verse 18, being, there, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for, at, for as ye have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness and to holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. Verse 21, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and being servants to God, ye have fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for, for bringing us to fellowship this morning, Lord. It's such a blessing um, to be in your house and to, to, to be hearing, um, to, to just be able to listen to your word, God, either through in person or, 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 or online. And um, God, we just thank you so much for that, um, that blessing we have of, of being able to, to fellowship and to worship with you, God. We love you. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would um, work in our hearts, um, the, the places that we're not surrendered to you, God. Would you, would you convict our hearts? Would you bring those to light so that we can deal with it, God, and, and be um, a, a holy sacrifice unto you. God, we love you. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. So, like I said, Romans 6.13 was our, was our theme verse. So I kind of like to go through the three different parts of this verse. So um, starting off, it says, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. So this, this word yield, you'll, you'll notice it's actually in this verse twice. And in this chapter, it's actually in the whole chapter four times. And throughout the whole Bible, that word yield is only in, in there 30 times. So pretty significant that it's in this verse twice and also in the, in the chapter four times as well. So if you're like me, when I, when I think of yield, I see that sign, right? You're driving down, you're, you're in a hurry to get someplace, but you see this yield sign, you're like, okay, I guess that means I have to slow down or stop so that everybody else can go, right? And so the, the whole concept, right, is that we give way, right, or, or we concede, okay? So it, once again, if you're, you know, when you see this sign, that means, hey, if somebody else is in front of you, you got to give them the right away, right? And um, so I, I always kind of think of this, you know, kind of in reference to a, to a stop sign, right? So a little bit of a test for you guys. We'll see if you guys get it. Four-way stop, okay? Let's say me and Tyler come to a four-way stop, exact same time. Who gets the right away? To the right. Nice job. I'm impressed. I'm not going to lie. I don't know that I could have quoted that two days ago. But 
So if you didn't hear, it's the person to your right. So that means if I'm on the left, then I have to give way to Tyler, right? But what do we actually do? When we come up to a four-way stop and you're there at the exact same time, I know what I usually do. I kind of let off the brake, roll forward, see if they're going to roll forward too. If they do, then maybe I stop. But if not, then I go, right? And then we play this little song and dance, right? I'm not completely yielding to them, right? I'm just kind of, eh, I'm going to kind of go whenever I can, right? But that's, this whole concept is that we give way or we concede to somebody else. Now, within this verse... It starts off the first, the first part talking about do not yield your instruments as an, um, at, or your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but yield yourselves unto God. And I love the fact that it uses yield there because if you're like me, there, there's sin that, that you struggle through, right? It, 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 you know that you need to get it out of your life. You, you, you're, you're, you're really focused on it. You're really praying through it, but sometimes you screw up. Sometimes, sometimes it gets at you, and it's just this, this sin that's kind of weighing on you, right? That our whole lives are, are, are supposed to be us yielding more and more of ourselves to God and giving up those things that, 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 that don't please God in our lives. But this word yield, it, it's such, it paints us such a beautiful picture for sin in our lives because what this is telling you not to do is don't give up. Don't give up. Each one of us has a sin that we're working through in our lives, but what, what the Word wants you to do is to keep fighting through it. If you screwed up last night, then, then step out today and, and fight through it today. Don't let your past sins affect where you're going in the future. So when it says not to yield at, to, to unrighteousness, that means don't give up. Don't, don't sit back and think, you know what, I just can't beat this bad habit. I, I, whatever this stupid thing is in my life, it's not that big a deal, right? I can still serve God even though if I have this bad, you know, clo- or uh, sin in my closet, right? I, I can't seem to beat it, so I'm just going to try and serve God through it, right? No, that, that's yielding. That, that's giving up and saying, you know what? I, I, I don't think I can do this anymore. But what God wants you to do is to continue to fight through it. Continue to fight through it. You might deal with it for the better part of your life, but you know what the, you know what the beautiful thing about yielding is? Is that God cares more about your heart attitude about it. Okay, there, there was a story that we talked about at camp about the, um, the woman who brings two mites, right? And so everybody's, you know, praising all the people around the, in the church for, for bringing all this money. But yet the, the person that, that's pointed out in the scripture is the, is the woman that brings the two mites. Why? Because that's all she had. She gave everything that she had. Whereas these other rich guys gave 15, maybe they gave 20, who knows, right? But that's not what's pointed out. It's the fact that they gave every, she gave everything that she had. And so that, that's our example here, right? Is we're supposed to yield. We're supposed to be willing to surrender whatever we have to the Lord. So we see this. We're not supposed to yield unto sin, right? But the, the next part of this verse is, is pretty cool as well, right? So we see that neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God. Yield yourselves unto God. So that same concept we just talked about, right? Don't yield yourselves, as, don't yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness in the same way that we're not supposed to just give up to sin, that just throw our hands up and be like, you know what, I'm never going to beat this thing, I'm just going to live with it. In that same way how we're not supposed to give up to sin, we're also supposed to give up to the Lord. We're also supposed to give up ourselves to the Lord because you know what, our lives are in a, in a, in a way better place in his hands than they are in mine or in yours. So we're supposed to just yield ourselves up and say, you know what, God, I, whatever you, whatever you want to do in my life, it's yours. I don't know if you guys remember that song, Free Falling, right? Sometimes, right, sometimes that's what it feels like when you're in the hands of the Lord. You're just free falling. You're like, I don't know where you're taking me, God, but I'm along for the ride. And I trust that if I give myself over to you, things are going to work out a whole lot better than if I try to control them on myself. So this, there's an interesting phrase here that, that's in white, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Alive from from the dead. Now, it doesn't just say for those that are alive, right? It specifically says those that are alive from the dead. Why? Because at one point, before you accepted Christ, you were dead in your trespasses. You had no hope. That same, that same repetitive sin that we were talking about, how you couldn't get over it, you didn't have any hope. Sure, you could, you could muster up some strength on your own. Maybe you'd be able to kick a few bad habits, but you don't have the power of Jesus in your life. And so it likens itself, so if, if you want to jump over back to, to verse 4 here, um, staying in Romans 6, Romans 6, 4, it says, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so 
we also should walk in the newness of life. So just as Jesus was, was, was dead and buried with our transgression on his account and was, was raised to life, that's what our lives are supposed to be when we accept Christ. We're supposed, to take, we're, we're supposed to step out of the darkness of death and step into the light of Jesus Christ. So we're supposed to act like we're risen from the dead. Because spiritually we are. Now, I don't know about you, I've never been risen from the dead before physically. So if I'm to find an example of that, of how, what's, it, what's it supposed to look like for me to be risen from the dead, we actually have a few in Scripture. Okay, there's about, um, there's about seven or so, um, and there, there, there may be a few more as well that, you know, that are um, a little bit different context. But we're going to look at seven specifically where, uh, where somebody was dead, clearly dead, and then raised to life. Okay, so um, we'll, we'll jump into those. Um, before we do, man, this is a cool verse. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. New creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we're going to see that in, the, in these few examples here coming up. So the first one, the widow of Zarephath's son. Okay, so um, this, is, this one is found in 1 Kings um, chapter 17. So, um, so there's, this, there's this woman. Her, she, she, her, her son passes, and she decides that she's going to blame it on Elijah. Elijah, why, if you're such a man of God, why would this happen? Blah, 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 all this stuff, right? And then she's going to do a complete 180 when Elijah is able to raise her son from the dead through the power of God. You, you see the verse up there. And the woman said to Elijah after, after her, her son was raised, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is truth. So this lady who was questioning God, her son is all of a sudden raised from the dead. And her, her response is faith. Her response is faith. Because that's how, that's how our life should be when we're risen from the dead. When we're spiritually taken from death to life, not only should it inspire faith in us, it should also inspire faith around us. Because when, when people see us living a life, when, when, we were, when we used to be caught up in sin and, and, and in death, that should inspire faith for those around us. The next one is, is kind of a similar one. So we have the Shunammite woman's son. So this is in 2 Kings chapter 4. So essentially, really, really similar um, concept here of th this woman who, this was her only son. She was finally blessed with a child. Finally. This was her only son. And then he dies. And so here, <laughs> sorry, that was my daughter. Um, so here, th this is, so the first one was Elijah. This is Elisha. I'll try to make the distinction there. But um, so the second time here, Elisha once again, raises this child up from the dead through the power of God. And so what is the, the mother's response to this? Then she went in and fell at his feet and bowed herself to the ground and took up her son and went out. So what's her response to seeing from dead to life? Worship. Worship. And once again, look at this verse. Before she goes and picks up her son, what does she do? She falls at the feet of Elijah. So once again, going from death to life, we see faith and then we see worship. Now, it's going to take a little bit of a turn here because both of these were, were children, right? And we don't really see much reaction from the actual person who's raised from the dead. The next five examples, we're going to see the actual person. What, how does that person respond from going from, from death to life? So the next one is an Israelite man. If you've never read this story, this one's pretty cool. So basically the whole story is encapsulated in that verse. So it says, and it came to pass as they were burying a man that behold, they, they, um, they spied a band of men and they cast the men into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Wow. So this guy touches the bones of Elisha. A dead man touches the bones of Elisha. And what does it say? He revived and stood up on his feet. Revived and stood up on his feet. Now, when, whenever I've seen people, you know, come back from a coma or come back from the dead on TV shows, usually they just kind of open their eyes, right, kind of look around. They're like, wait, they're kind of in a fog, right? That's not what we see in Scripture. When these people go from death to life, he revived and stood up on his feet. There's no question. This guy has life. There's no question. Next one. Widow of Nain's son. So now we're out of the Old Testament going into the New Testament. So Jesus comes upon the city of Nain. He's standing outside the gates. 
and all of a sudden there's a, there's a procession, there's this guy being carried in a coffin, and behind him is, is, the mourning, is his mourning mother. So what happens? Jesus goes over and touches the coffin, and then we see in, in verse 15, and he that was dead sat up and began to speak, and he delivered him to his mother. So the last example we saw that the man rose from the dead and stood up, this one, he sits up and begins to speak. Begins to speak. He's not just waking up in a fog and looking around. He has instant life. That's what we have as well. When we go from death to life, we have instant life in the Lord. And what should we do? We should open our mouths and talk about it. Because you guys all have a cool story. If you're, if you're, if you're reborn this morning, you have an awesome story to tell other people about, about what God did in your life. And this guy... He got up and immediately spake. I don't know what he said, but I'm assuming it had something to do with the fact that I used to be dead and now I'm alive. So last three, we have Jairus' daughter. So this is also in, in, in the Gospel of Luke. So, you know, the, the daughter's brought to Jesus and we see that, um, we, we see that he, is, um, he, he goes to her. And in verse 55 in chapter 8, we see, And her spirit came again and she arose straightway. And what does Jesus do? He commanded to give her meat. He commanded to give her meat. That's kind of, that's kind of interesting to me. Why would, why would this person that was dead, what's the first thing we're going to do? We're going to feed her? It's kind of a cool picture, isn't it? When we go from death to life in Christ, what should we do? We should go read the word of God. Because we need to be nourished. She was dead. She wasn't eating while she was dead. She needs to be nourished. And what do we need as believers? We need to be nourished. So we need to be commanded to, get, to go get meat, to continue to go back to the word of God for the nourishment that we need. Because once again, if, if, you, if, if you've been saved recently or been saved for 25 years, that, that, that salvation story in you probably um, brought a lot of excitement into your life. And so when that excitement starts to wear off, you're like, okay, I've been saved for a little bit. How do, how do I continue to, to follow after God now that the, the fuzzies are gone, right? It's to go get in God's word and get, get nourished again. So the last two are pretty famous. So Lazarus is the next one. We have the whole book of John 11 that's devoted to this one, right? So you guys know the story. Um, his, his sisters come to Jesus and say, hey, he's, you know, he's not doing well, he's sick. And we, we notice that Jesus stays in, once he gets the message, he stays where he was for two days. And then he decides to come. Why? Over and over again, John records that Jesus does certain things so that we might believe. So that we might believe. His disciples ask him, hey, is he just sleeping? And Jesus responds, no, he's dead. There's no question about this. The guy was dead. Okay? So we see, so Jesus goes and calls and says, Lazarus, come, come out. And, and what, what is the response in verse 44? And he that was dead came forth bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus saith unto him, loose him and let him go. So Lazarus comes out all bound. He's got grave clothes on him. He's got a napkin over his face, which most of you guys can relate to today. So he's bound. And when I first read this, I, I, I went and talked to Dwayne about it because I was, my first thought was like, well, what the heck, Lazarus? If you're alive, why don't you just like bust out of the clothes, right, and, and, and go live, right? Because you have life and you used to be dead. But I think it's pretty cool, actually, that, that Jesus commands that the people around him loose him and let him go. Why? Because when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm dead in trespasses and I get new life, sometimes I like to hold on to that old life, don't you? You like to kind of drag it with you a little bit. Hold on to a few things, right? I, I know I'm, I'm Christ now, but I'm going to hold on to a few things. I, I, I'm not going to lose my whole identity, right? And so we, we keep pulling those things along with us. And we need that encouragement in our hearts and our lives to give that stuff up. We need that accountability. We need that encouragement to say, hey, those are old, stinky grave clothes. They need to be out of my life so that I can be fresh and new in Christ. Put those grave clothes aside. Loose him and let him go. And the last one, I don't have to tell you this story, Jesus. So he was dead, raised to life. And what does he come back and do? Romans, Romans, or sorry, that is not Romans. Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So not only does Jesus come back and teach us, he also gives us a command. He also gives us a purpose in our lives to go and teach all nations. Go and teach all nations. 
So these are some pretty cool examples, right? So we go from death to life. We're supposed to surrender under him as those that are alive from the dead. And we have some pretty cool examples of how to do that. Now, the last part of this, Romans 6.13. So we've talked about not yielding your members as un, of, of righteousness unto sin. We've talked about yielding yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. So this last part, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Okay, so if you're like some of our students, when they first got their shirt, they were like, why the heck is there a potato head on there? Somebody raise your hand if, the, if you're thinking that right now. Why, are, why is there a potato head on the screen? Kind of weird, right? And this was kind of our, our analogy throughout the, throughout the uh, weekend for camp. Because we sang a song a lot at camp called I Surrender by Hillsong. You guys have probably all sang it, right? And for those of you guys that are fans of hymns, I Surrender All, right? Pretty cool songs about surrendering. And so we all do that as believers. We say, here, God, take all of me. Here I am. Take me. I want you to use me in whatever way you can. The kind of sad part about when we say that, and I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not you know, talking bad about those things. I think one little trick I have is when, when I'm singing a worship song and I know it's not real true of me, I try to sing it as a prayer, right? I, I, I can't really say that I'm completely surrendered to you, God, but I can pray that I can be. Right, because I, I, I don't want to I don't want to sing lies unto you, God, but I can pray through worship that, that you will make me completely surrendered unto you. And so we say, Hey, God, I'm surrendered, but then we go throughout our week. On Monday, maybe we're asked to go serve somebody. And we're like, I'm kind of busy. I kind of already had some plans. You know, maybe, maybe next time. It, it doesn't work for me now, but you know, maybe, maybe next time. I don't quite have time to give you my hands. But, but next time, I'll, I'll give them to you, I promise. I'll, I'll serve, I'll give you money, whatever the case is, what, whatever way you can use my hands, I'll give them to you. And so immediately we go from, God hears all of me, to, you got most of me, right? You got most of me, you can, you can still, right? I, I still got some stuff on here, got a cool mustache, right? And then it comes to, hey, there's a guy across the room, he needs to hear about Jesus. You don't have to go that far, just, just across the room. I'm not asking you to go to Zambia right now. Just, just walk across the room. And we start to make excuses. That guy looks a little mad. Maybe he's having a private time. Maybe, maybe he's in a bad mood. Maybe, maybe I'm, not the right, I'm probably not the right person. That guy looks way smarter than me. He probably knows way more about the Bible. What am I going to teach him? And so all of a sudden, now, now God doesn't have our feet either. We're not going where God tells us to go. I'm not going to lie, I can't think of anything for the nose, so I'm just going to throw that. <laughs> what about our ears? Our ears. This is a good one, isn't it? One of the things Randy was talking about with our high school students is he was really burdened when he was preparing the message that God wanted him to give him the very first part of his day. The very first part. I don't know about you, but my phone usually gets the first part of my day, doesn't it? I wake up, I turn it on, I see if I have any messages, see if anybody emailed me, probably check Facebook, who knows, or Instagram, whatever the case is, right? I'm probably not super unlike most of you, but God was really challenging Randy to just give him the first part of your day. The first part that you have, give it over to God. So that kind of sets the tone for the rest of your day, right? I'm going to give my, myself over to you. Or maybe, maybe for you it's, I woke up a little bit late on Sunday, I didn't, I don't want to walk in church late, so I'll just skip this week. I'll go next week. Or, or maybe a Wednesday night, right? Long day at work, long day with my family, whatever the case is. I don't, I'll, I'll listen later. I'll listen later. Trust me. I'll, 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 maybe, I'll even, maybe I'll even listen to an extra sermon on top of what I already listened to, right? Or maybe our eyes. This is a big struggle for our students. There is so much around the world it is easier to see things that you shouldn't see than, than ever. I, I'm still kind of dumbfounded at the fact that there's curse words on billboards. Like, that, that's just, the first time I saw it, I was like, wait a second, that shouldn't be legal. What's going on? I thought there was a rule against that. It's so easy to see things that we shouldn't see. And this goes the opposite way too, right? You guys have some incredible examples in your life, members of this church, pastors at this church, that sacrifice and give themselves to the Lord. What about surrounding yourself with those people? What about putting examples in your life that when you see them, you're encouraged, not drawn down? It's up to you. I, I, we always encourage the students in, in our youth group that don't let Satan, you know, completely tear you down with your eyes, right? Because 
let's be honest, there's some times when you guys see some things that you shouldn't see and it's not your fault. It's not. You could be, you could be walking down the road and see something that you shouldn't see, and so then what, is, what, what should your response be? Don't give that second look. Turn your face. You have control of your eyes, so, so close them or look at something else. Because what, what, what a lot of times what happens, even if you are surrendering your eyes and, and looking away from those things, Satan will come into your life and be like, you looked at that? You're worthless. What are you doing? Why are you looking at that? And now all, all of a sudden you're convicted about a sin that you didn't even commit. Because you're so, you're, and it's a good thing, right? You're so focused on keeping your eyes holy. But that second look, right? We've been talking about David, right? That's the, if, if he would have just saw, turned away, we'd be missing that, that whole portion of the Bible, wouldn't we? Because he would have followed God and decided not to go do those things. I'm not going to lie. This one was the one that God was working on me for. My mouth. My mouth. Because so many different times in my life, I know God wants me to speak up. I know it. There, just this week, there's this kid that came up to the church and was playing basketball. And the first day, I kind of went out there and kind of talked to him a little bit. And literally, like, I was over there, like, you know, putting stuff away in the bathroom, um, replenishing the paper, paper towels or something. And I saw him up there again. And so I was like, all right, I didn't do it yesterday. So, God, it's pretty clear that you want me to go talk to him today. So I stopped what I was doing. I went over there and just invited him to church. It really wasn't that hard. Turns out he was a regular dude. He wasn't that scary. But inside my heart, I was telling myself, oh, man, that, that guy doesn't want to hear about God. He just wants to play basketball, leave me alone. But no, God was just challenging me to open my mouth. Just open your mouth. So the last few, I know this isn't a mind, but we're going to use it as. Your mind. Are you willing to give your mind over to the Lord? When Randy was speaking to our high school, he talked about renewing your mind, right? Renewing your mind. Because if you think like the world, then you're going to act like the world. But if you think the thoughts of the Lord throughout the day, you're going to act like you're going to act like your savior. Because you're thinking like him. We we've been talking a lot about the parable of the sower uh, within our youth group. And so you know, we, we, the, that whole parable, right, it talks about how, um, you know, the, the, the seed goes out and then we talk about the different grounds, right? Well, Luke 8, 8 talks about being a good ground. And when you're a good ground, you bear forth much fruit. And then in Luke 8, 18, it talks about take heed therefore how ye hear. Take heed therefore how ye hear. And for me, you know, the first, first, time, first few times I read that passage, I, I thought about giving the gospel, right? So we're, we're, we're walking around, we're giving the gospel to other people. But the fact of the matter is that passage says the, the, the seed is the word of God. So completely applicable to the gospel, but it's also just, it applies to the word of God as well. And so when every single day when you read the word of God, you have to be good ground. Because if you're not, you might read that passage and just push it aside. This thing doesn't, I don't really like what this passage says. Let's, maybe I can find a way that it doesn't apply to me. That'd be nice, right? I don't want to have to deal with this. So let me, let me find a way to, to get out of this passage. Or maybe, maybe if you're like me, if you read too quick, you completely forget it. We have to be good ground so that when we read the word of God, it changes us. It changes who you are because of what you read and you allowed it to renew your mind. So the last one, I don't have one for either, but it's your heart. We talked about this on the last day of both camps about surrendering your heart. And I'm not gonna lie, if you, if you ask me, this one, I think this one's the most important. Because when you surrender your heart up to God, you start to love the things of God. Instead of loving the things of this world, you decide, you know what? My God loves this, why don't I love it? And so then you start reading his word and your heart draws you to give other members over to God because of God working on your heart. When you have a soft heart towards God and you're willing to change the things that you love, it affects the rest of your life. And so now I've kind of decided, you know, I'm kind of holding on to these members. I'm not quite ready to give up my heart. I'm not quite ready to give up my hands. And so what are we left with? A potato. Unfortunately, this has been true in my life at times. I tell God I'm going to give you all, everything, and then by the end of the week, all he has is a potato. It's good. I mean, he has part of me, right? But God wants all of us. God wants more than a potato. He wants more. He wants, he wants all of your members. And I know you're not going to give him all your members every single day. 
But can God change your heart to where you're willing and be convicted and give more and more of yourself over to him? Because the crazy part is God can use you. No matter, even, even the times where we don't give our whole selves over to him, he still uses us. He uses me through, through sins that I commit. He, 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 teaches, he teaches me through things that I screw up. And, and, and so he's still able to use me even when I'm not fully surrendered. So what could God do when we're fully surrendered to him? What could he do? So there's this cool passage in Luke 9 that talks about there's three people that come up to Jesus. Two of them come up to Jesus and they say, hey, I want to follow you. And then another one, Jesus actually comes to them and says, hey, will you follow me? And the, 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 uh, the responses are pretty cool. So the first one, Jesus comes up to him and says, hey, or the, this guy comes to Jesus and says, hey, I want to follow you. And Jesus' response is the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but, but those that follow me don't have a place to lay their head. And then the second guy comes up. This is the account of the second guy. This one, Jesus actually comes to him and says, hey, follow me. And his response, and he said unto another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to bury my father, to go and bury my father. And the third guy comes up to Jesus and says, hey, I want to follow you. And, Jesus is rest- or, and, Jesus, and so um, the, the guy's response is, well, hold up. Let me first go say bye to my family. Let me first go say bye to my These aren't bad things, right? Burying your father and saying bye to your family aren't bad things, but it's your heart attitude that, that's important to God. See, I don't, I don't know what, what would have happened if, if this guy would have just walked up and said, hey, God, whatever you want, all of me, here you go. Maybe Jesus would have said, okay, go bury your father and then come over here. Because that's a different heart attitude, isn't it? Instead of saying, hey, God, I'll follow you after I get some other stuff taken care of, it's, hey, God, if you want to take care of this other stuff through me, awesome, but it doesn't really matter because I'm going to follow you. That's a whole different heart attitude, isn't it? And I kind of highlighted a few words in that verse. Lord, me first. This is actually the exact, the, the exact same words are, are in the next verse as well. Lord, me first. So one of the, one of the, one of the um, passages that, that Dwayne talked about with our junior high was the passage about the, um, the boy with the five loaves and two fishes, right? So he gave, he gave those things over to God, and what happened? God multiplied them. God gave, him, God gave it right back to him. I'm pretty sure that kid didn't go hungry. And so sometimes in our lives when we give things over to God, he gives them right back. There was a, there was a I got saved around, like right before high school. And so I, my identity was probably basketball. That's probably what most people knew me for. That's what I cared about. That's what I did a lot. And so God kind of challenged me like, hey, would you be willing to give up basketball? And so I talked to my coaches about it. I talked to some other people in my life about it. And eventually I got to the point where I was like, you know what, God, if you want basketball, it's yours. If you want me to quit, it's yours. I think this was right before my sophomore year, maybe junior year. I was making my way up to varsity. And yet I said, God, if you want me to quit basketball, I will. And you know what? He said, no, you're good. Just give it to me. And so he showed me how to play basketball for God. He showed me how to take those things and use it for his glory. So sometimes you're going to give things over to God and he's going to turn around and give it right back, which is beautiful. But sometimes, like we talked about last week, you're going to give some stuff over to God, and it might hurt. It might hurt. I, I you know, from uh, obviously this passage is more in, in, in relation to David giving up sacrifices for his sin. But there's going to be times where you give things over to God, and you're going to miss it. But you need to be reminded that, man, when, when I give things over to God and it costs me something, I'm going to be blessed for that. I'm going to be blessed for that because... I'm, I'm giving myself over to God. The, one, of the, one of the cool passages we talked about was the, 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 the woman who gave, came and gave Jesus the two mites. This is, this is all I have. Here it is. So guys, our students were challenged with this this past weekend, and I hope that we can be challenged with it as a church as well. Let's give God more than the potato. It's worth it. Whatever you give up for God, it'll be worth it. Let's pray. God, we love you so much, Lord. Thank you so much for your word. God, thank you so much for the examples in your word of when we're encouraged and challenged to give ourselves over to you, Lord. God, we love you. Lord, please take that thing, God, that we're holding on to, God, and and encourage our hearts. Give us the courage that we need to give it over to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.